The next person on the list is Brendan Jett. Yeah! Okay, I'm just gonna read uh, The Hollow Men by uh, T.S. Eliot. Alright, so, uh, Mr. Kurtz, he dead. A penny for the old guy. We are the hollow men. We are the stuffed men, leaning together, headpiece filled with straw. Alas, our dry voices, when we whisper together, are, are quiet and meaningless as wind and dry grass, or rats' feet over broken glass in our dry cellar, shape without form, shape without color. Paralyzed force, gesture without motion. Those who have crossed with direct eyes to death's other kingdom, remember us, if at all, not as lost, violent souls, but only as the hollow men, the stuffed men, eyes I dare not meet in dreams, and death's dream kingdom. Those do not appear. There the eyes are, sunlight on broken column. There is a tree swinging, and voices are, and the wind singing, more distant and more solemn than a fading star. Let me be no nearer in death's dream kingdom. Let me also wear such deliberate disguises, rat's coat, cow skin, cross stabs, and a field, behaving as the wind behaves, no nearer. Not that final meeting in the twilight kingdom. This is the dead land. This is the cactus land. Here the stone images are raised. Here they receive the supplication of a dead man's hand. Under the twinkle of a fading star, is it like this in death's other kingdom, walking alone at the hour when we are trembling with tenderness, lips that will kiss, form prayers to broken stone? The eyes are not here. There are no eyes here in this valley of dying stars, in this hollow valley, this broken jaw of our lost kingdoms. In this last of meeting places, we grope together and avoid speech, gathered on this beach of the Tumid River. Sightless, unless the eyes reappear is a perpetual star multifolate rows of death's twilight kingdom the hope only of empty men here we go round the prickly pear prickly pear prickly pear here we go round the prickly pear at five o'clock in the morning between the idea and the reality between the motion and the act falls the shadow for thine is the kingdom between the conception and the creation between the emotion and the response falls the shadow. Life is very long. Between the desire and the spasm, between the potency and the existence, between the essence and the descent, falls the shadow. For thine is the kingdom. For thine is. Life is. For thine is. This is the way the world ends. This is the way the world ends. This is the way the world ends. Not with a bang, but a whimper. Thank you, Brandon. The next person on the list is Chris Ilby. Yeah, you got close there, most people. You'll see. Oh, you'll see. Yep. Right. Yeah. I'm going to read an excerpt from a little book by a guy named Frederick Nietzsche. For some people who probably heard of him. Has anyone read Dust Boat Zarathustra before? All right, great. There we go. All right, the book's basically a book about philosophy told through the story of a man traveling from village to village and sharing his knowledge with them. I'm going to read about two or three chapters from it, and uh, I guess we'll start here. <clears throat> when Zarathustra arrived at the edge of the forest, he came upon a town. Many people had gathered there in the marketplace to see a tightrope walker who had promised a performance. The crowd, believing that Zarathustra was the ringmaster, come to introduce the tightrope walker, walker, gathered around to listen, and Zarathustra spoke to the people. I teach you the overman. Mankind is something to be overcome. What have you done to overcome mankind? All beings so far have created something beyond themselves. Do you want to be the ebb of that great tide and revert back to the beast rather than the overcome mankind? What is the ache to a man? A laughingstock, a thing of shame? And just so shall a man be to the overman, a laughingstock, a thing of shame. You evolved from worm to man, but much within you is still a worm. Once you were apes, yet even now man is more of an ape than even the apes. Even the wisest among you is only a confusion and a hybrid of plant and phantom. But do I ask you to become phantoms and plants? 
Behold, I teach you the overman. The overman is the meaning of the earth. Let your will say, the overman shall be the meaning of the earth. I beg you, my brothers, remain true to the earth and believe not those who speak to you of otherworldly hopes. Poisoners are they, whether they know it or not. Despisers of life are they, decaying ones and poisoned one themselves, of whom the earth is weary, so away with them. Once blasphemy against God was the greatest blasphemy, but God died, and those blasphemers died along with him. Now to blaspheme against the earth is the greatest sin, and to rank love for the unknowable higher than the meaning of the earth. Once the soul looked contemptuously upon the body, and then that contempt was the supreme thing, the soul which the body leaned, monstrous and famished. Thus it thought to escape from the body and the earth, but that soul was itself lean, monstrous, and famished, and cruelty was the delight of this soul. So, my brothers, tell me, what does your body say about your soul? Is it not your soul poverty and filth and wretched contentment? In truth, man is a polluted river. One must be a seed to receive a polluted river without becoming defiled. I teach you the older man, he is that seed. In him, your great contempt can go under. What is the greatest thing you can experience? It is the hour of your greatest contempt. The hour in which even your happiness becomes loathsome to you, and so also your reason and virtue. The hour when you say, what good is my happiness? It is poverty and filth and wretched contentment, but my happiness should justify existence itself. The hour when you say, what good is my reason? Does it long for knowledge as a lion for his prey? It is poverty and filth and wretched contentment. The hour when you say, what good is my virtue? It has not yet driven me mad. How weary I am with my good and my evil. It is all poverty and filth and wretched contentment. The hour when you say, what good is my pity? Is not pity the cross on which he is nailed who loves man, but my pity is no crucifixion. Have you ever spoken like this? Have you ever cried like this? Ah, if you had heard, you cried this way. It is not your sin, it is your moderation that cries to heaven. Your very sparingness and sin cries to heaven. Where is the lightning that licked you with its tongue? Where is the madness with which you should be cleansed? Behold, I teach you the overman. He is that lightning. He is that madness. Now, while Zarathustra was speaking this way, someone in the crowd interrupted him. We've heard enough about the tiger walker. Now it's time to see him. While the crowd laughed at Zarathustra, the tiger walker believed, believing that he had been given this cue, began the performance. Zarathustra, however, looked at the people and wondered. Then he spoke thus Man is a rope stretched beyond the animal and the overman, a rope over an abyss, a dangerous crossing, a dangerous wayfaring, a dangerous looking back, a dangerous trembling and halting. What is great in man is that he is a bridge and not a goal. What is lovable in man is that he is overgoing and downgoing. I love those that know not how to live except as downdoors, for they are the overgoers. I love the great despisers because they are the great doors and arrows of longing for the other shore. I love those who do not seek first a reason beyond the stars for going down and being sacrifices, but sacrifice themselves to the earth, that the earth may become the overman's. I love him who lives in order to know and seeks to know in order that the overman may hereafter live. Thus he seeks his own downgoing. I love him who labors and invents that he may build the house for the overman and prepare, prepare for him earth, animal, plant. But thus he seeks his own downgoing. I love him who reserves no share of spirit for himself but wants to be wholly the spirit of his virtue. I love him who makes his virtue his inclination and destiny. Thus for the sake of his virtue he is willing to live on or live no more. I love him whose soul is lavish, who wants no thanks and does not give back, for he always gives and desires not to keep for himself. I love him who scatters golden words and advance for his deeds, and always does more than he promises, for he seeks his own downgoing. I love him who justifies the future ones, and redeems the past ones, for he is willing to perish through the present ones. I love him who chastens God, because he loves his God, for it is perished through the wrath of his God. I love him whose soul is deep, even in the wounding, and may perish through a small mutter. Thus he goes willingly over the bridge. I love him who is free spirit and free heart. Thus is his head only the bowels of his heart. His heart, however, causes his downgoing. Lo, I am a herald of the lightning and heavy drop of the cloud. The lightning, however, is the over man. When Zarathustra had spoken these words, he again looked at the people and was silent. And to his heart he said, There they stand, there they laugh. They do not understand me. I am not the mouth for these ears. Must one first batter their ears that they may learn to hear with their eyes? Must one clatter like kettle drums and penitential preachers, or do they only believe the stammerer? They have something of which they are proud. What do they call it? That which makes them proud? Culture, they call it. It distinguishes them from the goathers. They dislike, therefore, to hear of contempt of themselves. So I will appeal to their pride. I will speak to them of the most contemptible thing. That, however, is the last man. And thus spoke Zarathustra to the people. It is time for a man to fix his goal. It is time for a man to plant the seed of his highest hopes. His soil is still rich enough for it, but the soil will one day be poor and exhausted, 
and no lofty tree will, will no longer be able to grow there. Alas.